Stonehenge. Why was it built? What purpose did it serve? Was it a sacred place? Or for the sick? Was there a belief in an afterlife? Or was its purpose more practical for observing the sun, moon, stars and planets? Maybe it was all of these things. We should understand that it was in use for many centuries and had several phases of construction and change. Let us focus upon the third phase, when the huge sarsen stones were set in place. Stonehenge has such a remarkable form. There was nothing like it anywhere else in the world at that time. Form follows function, and so it is a fascinating task to examine carefully the form of Stonehenge in order to suggest its function. Let us search for clues. Although much of the monument has been destroyed, there is still much remaining. We should remain hopeful of success. If it were indeed an astronomical observatory, let us begin by considering the hemisphere of the sky. In order to state the position of an object in the sky, we divide the sky up into a grid. This is a fundamental first step in the task of mapping the sky. This is what astronomers do today and would have also been the task of astronomers in the past. The two main types of grid, the azimuth grid shown here and the equatorial grid which is described presently. The azimuth grid divides the sky with reference to the Earth's surface. There is a bearing angle such that north is 0 degrees, east is 90 degrees, south is 180 degrees and so on. The elevation angle is also defined. The horizon is 0 degrees with the angle increasing to an angle of 90 degrees vertically overhead. Here is the equatorial grid. It is defined with reference to the spin axis of the Earth. The point where the lines converge is the North Pole star. At the present time this is the star Polaris. If we were to set up a camera facing Polaris and set the camera to capture an image over a period of several hours, the stars would all form curves as they circle around Polaris appears fixed. Over a long period of time the spin axis of the Earth moves. The people who built Stonehenge some four and a half millennia ago would not have seen Polaris as the fixed star. Here we see both grids. Would the people of Stonehenge create images in the sky by joining the stars into groups? It is certainly possible and would have assisted with recognizing their movements. Here are the constellations that we see today. Many of them have ancient origins. For example, in the book of Job in the Bible, constellations are referred to as Maseroth. The book of Job is thought to be one of the oldest. It mentions Arcturus, Orion and the Pleiades. There is an alignment at Stonehenge which is well known. At the time of summer solstice, the sun rises and casts its light along the avenue and into the centre of the stones. Here is a sequence of images simulating the sunrise. It is inspiring to see the movement of the stars and the brightening of the sky before finally we see the sun rising. Clearly the alignment with the solstice sunrise demonstrates that there is some sort of association between the form of the monument and the movement of the sun. Is that all there is to it, or is there more? Let us now carefully examine the stones and search for clues. Here we see part of the circle of sarsen stones. Many of the stones are unfortunately missing, but we can recognize the pattern from this group. There were 30 upright stones placed accurately in a circle and joined together by lintels. The top of the lintels were carefully shaped and assembled to be accurately horizontal. This is our first clue. This image also shows that the spacings between the uprights of the circle are fairly wide. This could be our second clue. Within the circle there were five trilithons. A trilithon comprises two uprights and a lintel as shown here. It is interesting to see that the gaps between the uprights of the trilithons are narrow. This is our third clue. Our fourth clue is that the trilithon uprights are taller than the top of the lintels of the circle. The plan view of the monument is shown here. The lintels are omitted for clarity. The shape that the five trilithons make is named the horseshoe. We can ask the question, did the form of Stonehenge define a grid? In particular, if we consider the azimuth grid, 
was the top of the lintel of the circle defining the angle of zero degrees elevation? In other words, was it a horizon reference? If that is so, we should now consider how bearing angles could have been measured. Here is a simple aiming device for measuring alignments with objects on the horizon. It is just a strip of wood with two nails hammered in vertically. Let us try aiming it at something, for example the sun as it is adjacent to the horizon. OK, line the nails up with the sun. Is that working? Not really. We cannot see the sun because it is hidden behind the nails. And we cannot see the further nail because it is hidden by the closer nail. It is useless. Or is it? Consider viewing the sun as it appears between the nails. Rotate the wood so that the gap narrows, keeping the sun centralised between the nails. Finally, there is just a glimmer of light visible as the gap closes. At that point, the right-hand edge of the closer nail and the left-hand edge of the further nail are very accurately aligned with the position of the sun. Now consider that the upright stones of the trilithons are equivalent to the nails, and we can then find numerous important alignments not just of the sun, but of the moon also. That is it. Stonehenge is beautifully efficient in principle, but it is wonderfully elegant in its detailed design. It truly is the work of a genius. Here we see the nails with an artificial horizon added. This represents the top of the lintels of the Sarsen Circle. And here it is, looking from the correct viewing position. The sun can be fully seen between the nails, and so this is not representing a special date, such as solstice or equinox. Now that we know what to look for, here is the plan view again. Are there any significant alignments using the left edge of one trilithon upright and the right edge of another? Yes indeed there are. Here are the alignments with the moon rising and setting positions. There are also alignments with sunrise and sunset at the equinox and at the solstices, Furthermore, we can see that their appreciation of geometry was far advanced. They had divided the circle into 36 segments, many centuries before the Babylonians had divided the circle into 360 degrees. The history books will have to be rewritten. I hope that this brief video has shown you that Stonehenge was indeed designed for a particular functional purpose, primarily as a precision scientific instrument. Hopefully it has whetted your appetite for more, and there is indeed much more to see which has not been previously recognised. There are carvings in the ground surface at one monument, giving much new information about their understanding of the world and their role within it. In the Priscelli Mountains there are carvings on rocks, which gives us very significant new understanding of their religious beliefs. It is most unexpected and remarkable indeed. All of this is described in the book the bones of Stonehenge. Visit the website for further details. Studying Stonehenge and searching for clues has been a wonderful journey of discovery. I hope that you will be inspired to continue with this journey.